Welcome to Season 5, Episode 15 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be doing a coaching call with a teacher named Claire and exploring how to use your summer to tackle major time wasters and rethink what's really necessary. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the show notes and written highlights, as well as links to recommended resources or to share your thoughts on the show. So this episode is going to be the final one for season five of Truth For Teachers. We are wrapping up this week and preparing you for summer break. I want to help you make this your most productive and also your most relaxing summer yet. Those two things really aren't mutually exclusive. In fact, productivity and rest are actually interdependent. So I'm going to help you think through some of these productivity issues in this episode. And then don't worry, you won't be on your own until season six begins in August. I'll be back with a bonus extended episode in between seasons like I normally do. That's going to be probably in late June. And in this bonus episode, I'm going to teach you some awesome productivity habits and share more about how you can join the 40 hour teacher workweek club. The club is going to be open to new members from June 28th until July 7th. Now, make sure you stay tuned until the end of this episode, because I have another resource that's going to help you plan out your summer. It's a totally free on-demand video series, and I'm going to share at the end where you go to get it. But first, let's focus on the topic for this episode, because I think it's actually going to prepare you to watch the video series and kind of give you a, a running head start in terms of thinking these issues through. You're going to be listening in on a free coaching call that I conducted with a graduate of the 40-Hour Teacher Workmate Club. The call is sort of a combination of instructional coaching and life coaching, all kind of rolled into one, where I'm answering a teacher's specific question about productivity and balance and managing it all. This particular call is a teacher named Claire, and she teaches special education. She works with kids in grades K to 6, and she actually splits her time between two schools. So she's at one school with one group of kids in the morning and another in the afternoon. Claire's initial question is about how to use her summer to get ahead for fall when she doesn't know the needs of the students that she's going to have in her classroom. Her caseload can change a lot from year to year, and so that makes it really difficult for her to plan ahead. So we talked through some systems that she and really any teacher can create during the summer that will make the following school year easy to manage. We talk about getting digital files organized, getting procedures in place, and so on. I then challenge Claire to figure out two to three of her biggest time wasters and use her summer to figure out a better way. It's very hard to find the time and mental bandwidth to take the step back during the school year and really analyze systems. So summer is perfect for that. So I told Claire this, and and when she let me know what her biggest time suck is, when she talked about collecting data on student progress and grading student writing, She had a really big aha moment that I think is going to resonate with you in a powerful way too. Claire and I dug really deeply into how to analyze if something really has to be done. If the things that we perceive as mandated are in fact requirements. And analyze teaching practices through the lens of whether they're actually effective for kids rather than if they're the way they've always been done and the way that everyone else does them. I love that moment in our conversation. And I can't wait to share it with you. So here's Claire. So when prepping or planning in the summer, I never know what the year is going to be like because my kids are always so diverse. I never know what my schedule is going to look like at the start of the year. Um, What sort of things can I do during the summer to get ready for the school year other than just the layout of my classroom and um, expectations? So... I understand what you're saying here, especially, you know, when you're teaching special ed, because Mm -hmm. the kids are going to be completely different from year to year. So I think one of the main things that you can focus on is outlining your routines and your procedures, Mm -hmm. writing everything down about how you're going to run your classroom, I think can really help you solidify those things in your mind and provide a reference if needed for you. So if there are specific procedures that your students need reminders with all year long or things that just drive you crazy, Summertime Uh is a great time to plan out a better way, including how you're going to teach those expectations to students and model and practice and reinforce them because transitions and routines is something that you're probably going to have to do no matter which students you teach next year, right? Uh Absolutely. 
So that's one one place to start. Another thing that you can think about is writing out lesson plans for the things that you need to teach during the first week of school. So you won't follow them exactly. You won't get to everything that you've planned, but you should know which procedures you want to teach and when you're going to teach them and how you'll teach them. So you can choose over the summer some get to know you activities, some community building resources. And then once you have your class list and you know what you're working with, all you have left to do at that point is decide you know, which ones are most appropriate and just sort of plug them into your schedule. So having this kind Uh of really precise written breakdown of what you're teaching and when will help you prevent those first day of school nightmares where, you know, you're worried about what to expect. Does that make sense? Is that only something that would be helpful? Absolutely. So another thing that you can do over the summer is organize your digital files and your teaching resources. So sometimes lesson planning can feel overwhelming or take a really long time because we have too many resources and we have a lot of things that Uh we don't like. And so, you know, it's sort of like opening up your overstuffed bedroom closet and you realize that you're wearing those same 10 outfits over and over again. Get rid of those things that you don't like. And that will make it easier to find the things that you do like when it's time to plan. So you can use your summer to toss out or pass on any kind of materials that you don't absolutely love using with your students. Okay. Do you have a system mm-hmm. now for organizing your digital files? Um, I do. I have on my desktop, I have all of my special ed specific stuff in one file. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's like called, I call it my caseload for the 2016-17 year. And within that file, I have my two different schools. Um, and so everything specific to the schools goes into each file. And then within that file, I have all of my um, student files. So any documents I pull up or type up um, for a specific student, like a behavior chart or anything, goes into those files. But then I also have a large general file for like all of my other resources that are not special ed specific. So like any sort of language arts lessons or math worksheets, anything I use, like that goes into the other file. Is that where you're keeping the things that you've um, gotten from Teachers Pay Teachers? Yes. <laughs> and that one is broken up into like, I really didn't know how to do it and I'm not the best organizer. So I did like <laughs> language arts and then I did math. But at the same time, I was like, should I do grade level specific since I work with all my different grades? But then sometimes I use those materials for older students. Mm-hmm. who are sixth graders working at a third grade level. So it, it got confusing from there. And are these Dropbox folders, did you say? Um, so I have some Dropbox folders, um, but not all of them. They're just on my desktop. Um, but I do have a couple Dropbox folders. <laughs> okay. So that might be the first step then is to get, and again, this is a summer project. Don't try to do this during the school year. You've got way too much on your plate. But but during the summer, think about, I would recommend using Dropbox for everything. I love it. Um, some people prefer Google Drive. There's other alternatives. Um, I just like Dropbox because I find it really easy to use. It's completely free and it's going to sync across all your mm-hmm. devices. So if you're using right. you know, your mobile device, your school computer, home computer, wherever, everything is still going to be there and you only only have to organize it one time. And if something happens right. to your computer, it's backed up. It's all in the cloud. So anything that's on your desktop right, right now, if something happens to that desktop, you're in big trouble. <laughs> I know. It's so true. <laughs> it's hard. So it's, it, it does take a while to get set up and it does require that investment of time. So I would recommend getting everything um, in Dropbox. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, even if you can't organize it, just keep it in one file that just is called, you know, just the language arts file. That's fine. At least it's in there. And then what uh-huh. you can do is when you get new resources, you can add them to the folder. So it can feel really overwhelming to look at hundreds of different files and be like, oh my gosh, I have to sort through all this. You don't have to do uh-huh. that step right away. Just when you get a new resource, you know, something that you've created or a coworker shared or something new that you've gotten, create a, a good file full of good um, file folder for it and organize it that the way that you want it to be. So everything new coming in is organized. And then you can get to the to the other stuff, the existing stuff, you can go back through and organize that later over the summer or just whenever you end up having time. So don't try to do all of that at once. Just focus on the new things coming in and making sure that they're organized. And I would say use use an organizational system that is intuitive for you. Don't make it over okay. overly complicated. When you're whatever your first thought is, when you're thinking, okay, where should I put this or where would this be? Put it there, 
And if you go looking for it and it's not there, move it to that spot. So really work with your intuition. You don't want to have to overthink this and go hunting around for things. Even if maybe it's not the best classification, if maybe technically it should probably be in this other folder, whatever pops into your head first, that's where you want to keep it because it's going to make it easier for you to find it. So go with something really super simple, something that makes sense to you. Um, rather than worry about having really super neat categories that would make sense to other people. It only has to make sense to you. (laughs) So summer is a great time to organize your files and activities. And then once you've done that, and really as you're going through with that too, that's a good time to find more because it's a lot more efficient to batch similar tasks and do similar things at Uh once, right? So go ahead, dedicate an entire afternoon sometime in the summer to just looking on Pinterest for all kinds of awesome materials. That way you don't have to go on there every single weekend to find resources for just your current unit of study. So you can get ahead in the summer by listing out the skills and standards that you know you need more activities for and search them out online. And you might want to start with the topics that you really dread teaching because you personally dislike them. Uh, You just don't connect with them or you have a really hard time making them understandable and meaningful for kids. So look for teaching ideas that will improve those units. Focus on that over the summer rather than just on the things that you love and that you're excited about. And then save those in the Dropbox folder. And that way, when it's time to lesson plan during the school year, all you have to do is plug them into your lesson plans. So that's a great idea. Those are just really just a couple general ideas. But the main thing that I want you to do this summer to prepare is to focus on identifying a couple of your biggest stressors and your biggest time wasters that you've had during the previous school year and plan out ways to streamline or simplify. So did you spend too much time grading papers or were you lost when you were figuring out how to differentiate? Or did you get bogged down in data collection and paperwork? So start brainstorming solutions for that so that the next school year will be different. And you can talk with other teachers, including teachers online, and look for suggestions in teacher blogs and Pinterest or, you know, read a book on the topic. Be really proactive and take charge of your professional development. If there's some aspect of your work that's really stressing you out, look for a better way over the summer so that no matter what happens during the school year, you know you have this wide range of resources you found that will help you tackle your biggest problems. So as I'm saying that, is there a topic that comes to mind right away as I'm talking, something that you feel like is one of your biggest stressors, something that just takes up way too much time and energy for you? Um, Definitely data collection Mm -hmm. um, because when it comes to those specific goals. um, I'm just having trouble keeping, like deciding, do I just give up my days and do data collection on instead of teaching? And then if I have other people do data collection for me, like my age. How much time do you think that you um, are spending on Everything just goes into like one box. It depends on, like some tasks, because of the program, some tasks, I know that I can just like look over and look for completeness. And so I just like check those off and send those those home. Mm -hmm. Um, And then others, like especially writing, it takes me like 45 minutes per kid sometimes. Okay. So tell me more about your process with that. What kind of marking and corrections and comments are you making? If you're spending 45 minutes on the student, what kind of feedback are you giving? So we look at, I look at capitalization, punctuation, and then sentence structure, of course. So on a shorter um, assignment, that's easier, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I also go through and do what we do on our testing. Um, When we're first testing a kid for special education, we have to do mark every, um, essentially every correct word sequence. So in between each word are like in a sentence. Um, is the if there's a misspelled word then you have to mark two (laughs) incorrect there's like two dots to show incorrect Mm -hmm. word um spelling and you have to go through every single word every single period and give a point for that as well so when you say that you have to mark every single error any kind of capitalization error any kind of spelling error who who says you have to do that that is the way I've seen every <laughs> every other special ed teacher do it um, in my district. Do you have but to do that? That is a good question. I don't think I <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you think it benefits the kids? No. How come? I, um, because, I don't know, I guess it's, it's kind of, it gives you an overall score, but then it doesn't like deal with any of the specifics, I guess. And that really doesn't 
help them improve those specific problems that they have. Right. Because you're finding all the errors for them. You're marking it yeah. all. And then what do they do? They look at it and like, oh, okay. Stuck it in the backpack yeah, and it goes home. Yeah, like, they scared because there's so many marks on it. Because you mm. mark them negatives and positives. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's not benefiting them, I don't think. So we have really young kids. We have kids who are six, seven, eight years old who have learning mm-hmm. disabilities of some sort. And they're getting this paper back that has an insane amount of marks on it. Everything good they did, everything wrong that they did is all corrected for them and all marked on there. Yeah. So it's not helping the kids improve. And it's using up a whole lot of your time. And technically, you don't have to do it. That's just the way that it's always been done by all the other teachers. Yeah. <laughs> Is that maybe something that you could experiment with a different way of doing? Yes, I think so. Definitely. I have, I've been frustrated with it, like, all, every year that I've been teaching. Um, but I just haven't, there hasn't been, a, like, an opportunity or I just haven't done it. To the point, because I feel like a rubric, a simplified version of the Common Core rubric that we're supposed to use would be best, but I just haven't taken the time to create one mm-hmm. and then use, introduce it to my students and use that and have like a writing conference. Yep. Which I think would be best. I, th- better. I think that's a fantastic solution. Put that on like a long term to do list. You don't need to do that now because you've got tons of things on your plate, but that's something that you could do over the summer. That's a system that you can set up and then you'll have that ready to go. Because if you're grading from a rubric, that's going to save you tons of time. And you don't have to, I don't think, and you can correct me if maybe it's, you have a different requirement in your school, but do you have to grade on every trait for every assignment? No, I don't believe so. So that would really help too. Sometimes you can just be looking for ideas and content. Sometimes you could just be looking for mechanics. You don't have to grade on everything. That'd be so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no one forcing you to do it that way, then you don't need to. Because think about the way that we teach writing to kids, right? Like we don't we don't teach every single skill in every single writing lesson. Like there's something that we're looking for. There's some sort of mini lesson where, okay, I want you to focus on this particular thing, on voice or on sentence fluency, whatever it is. And then they're practicing that. So we don't need to grade it on everything every single time. Certain writing assignments, yes, because you want to have a holistic look at how their writing is improving. But everything they write, we don't need to correct spelling and grammar and ideas and capitalization that's just creating right. extra work. And really, it's overwhelming for them. It's much easier for the kids if we're focusing on teaching and assessing one thing at a time. Very much so. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just so, No, it's okay. <laughs> Tell me how you're feeling about that. Is there, is it, are you feeling there's a part of you that's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can get away with that. I don't know if I can do it. Is there a part of you that's hesitating? A little bit, but I still feel like, um, well, just because like when we come into IEP meetings, they expect expect us to, or at least I feel like parents and teachers and principals expect us to know the ins and out of this child, every skill that they have and mm-hmm. every, every skill that they don't have according to the standards. So I guess that's part of what's been motivating me to like follow other teachers and do exactly what they're doing as mm-hmm. well. So do you think it's that you need to know it or that you need to have proof that you know it? Which one is like sort of bothering you more? If you do this, are you worried that you won't know where the kids are at? Or are you worried that you won't have as much proof that you know? Definitely proof. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's the easier part because if you are confident these new ways of assessing, you're still going to have a handle on what your kids know and are able to do. Then all you have to do now is make sure that you have sufficient documentation. And that's really mm-hmm. easy because you're going to have multiple pieces of evidence for that right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be able to speak confidently about it because you know that going through and finding every little capitalization error, it doesn't, that doesn't give you a better understanding. Like if I were to ask you to name who in your class right now knows how to capitalize the first word in a sentence and who doesn't, you already know that, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So all you need is a piece of evidence for that. And you need to be able to speak confidently about it. If you know your kids, that's going to come through. And I'm sure you are doing enough data collection. Like, I don't know any teacher who has a shortage of data collection, right? (laughs) You have tons of data in there to back this up. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend looking at your teaching practices through the lens of what is most effective for the kids and what's the most effective use of your time and to not let yourself be driven by what you see other teachers doing. 
or the way that it's always been done or what a parent might ask for. Because if a parent asks for something in an IEP meeting that you don't have, then you just say, I don't have that. Next time we meet, I'll have it for you. Or, you know what, yeah. I'll, I'll do that this afternoon. I, actually, I would like to know. I'm not really sure if he's able to do that at this point. I'm going to sit down with him this afternoon. I'll send you an email. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. you, don't, you don't have to have everything at all times. You just, as long as you have a gauge on what your kids know and are able to do, you're going to be fine. And I think it's easy to sort of create these ideas for ourselves. Like we want to, we want to sort of cover ourselves in every single scenario so that we're never left Mm -hmm. unprepared, but it's okay to put the kids first and to think about what makes sense first. So that is your plan for the summer. (laughs) You're going to get files organized. You're going to get teaching ideas together. So you have your great resources and they're, you know, they're in one place. So that way when it's time to plan, you don't have to spend all your evenings online looking through things. And you're going to think about some of these aspects of your teaching that you feel like are taking up too much time and brainstorm better solutions. Because when when you invest time in trying to figure out a better system, it's going to save you so much time and energy throughout the school year. So what stood out to you most in the conversation that you feel like you want to take action on right away? We've talked a lot about summer. Is there anything that you want to take action on now? Um, Definitely. The, I mean, the writing. Literally, I if you were to ask, me any day of the week like what what is the goal that you have the hardest time like uh taking data on it's definitely writing but I really do feel like being able to not have not worry so much about like the whole analysis every Mm -hmm. single time just makes me feel a lot better (laughs) because you're right good (laughs) something that other other teachers have done but it's not required you're still going to know your kids really well um, because that's what you do. You're a teacher. (laughs) Trust yourself. (laughs) I can't wait till summer so I can get all this stuff done. (laughs) Awesome. And please do come to the Facebook group. Ask these kinds of questions there and we will help you work through them um, and give you some some alternative ways to to approach some of these topics because they're tough. They're really, they're tough issues to work through, but, you know, sort of getting out of your bubble and being able to talk to other teachers can make a big difference. Mm-hmm, definitely. I feel like I have so much more of a plan for my summer now, and I really can see it in the future, like affecting my mental state throughout the, <laughs> the school year. So I'm excited about it. So that was a powerful conversation with Claire, wasn't it? I thought this would be a great way to end the season of the podcast and get you thinking more about how you want to use your summer. I promised you at the beginning of the episode that I had another free resource to help you dig deeper into productivity issues, and that is a free video series called Five Summer Secrets to a Stress-Free Fall. I'm offering it in a new format. I've never done it this way before, any of my trainings this way before, where I've broken it up into seven short videos, and then you get access to all of them all at once on a single page, and you can watch them whenever it's most convenient for you. There's also a note-taking guide and some printables, and there's an audio-only version because I know a lot of you who listen to the podcast are used to listening to me on the go. You don't want to sit in front of a computer and watch videos. So you can do that with this training too. Just download the MP3 and you're good to go. In the video series, as well as the audio, I'm sharing practical time-saving strategies and really simple mindset shifts that will help you discover how to create your end-of-summer vision. What do you want your life to look like when summer is over? I'm going to help you think that through. And then you're going to select attainable, realistic goals that will move you toward that vision. I'm going to teach you five productivity strategies for home and school, and they're going to help you feel more accomplished and allow you to truly relax this summer and turn off that teacher brain. Stop thinking about school for a short period of time at least. And finally, in the video series, I'm going to give you ideas for using your summer to get ahead, including key tasks that can be done over your break to free up more time once school begins. So if you want to check out the five summer secrets to a stress-free fall video series, just go to thecornerstoneforteachers.com slash secrets, thecornerstoneforteachers.com slash secrets, and you can watch them right away. So I hope you end the school year strong, and I hope that you make a solid plan this summer to make sure that your time doesn't slip away from you too fast. Keep an eye out for that bonus extended episode in late June, and enjoy the video series in the meantime. 
Have a wonderful summer. I will be back with you again the first week of August for season six. Remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth for Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.